Hello, Cinnabar Bar Moss, or any kind of moth you'd like to be. Welcome to the Writer's Triangle, Cinnabar Bar Moss podcast about all things publishing and books. Today we're here at Leia Don, our writer in residence for Cinnabar Bar Moth Collections. How are you doing today? I'm doing okay. How about you? I'm doing great. Thanks for asking. Thank you for being on. Yeah. So, so today we're going to be talking about diversity in writing. And I was wondering, when did you first learn about the concept of diversity and what does diversity in writing mean to you? I mean, I think this is such an odd topic. I mean, I, th- I think like the idea of diversity probably popped up, you know, 20, 2012 or somewhere around there when I first started, um, you know, going back to college. Uh yeah, I think maybe that's, I mean, this is stretching back, so uh, <laughs> that's probably the first time I ever recall, you know, really hearing it used anyway. Um, as far as, like, it's such a, I, I, you know, I have mixed feelings about this topic. I'm sure we'll get to that. I think, like, in theory, diversity in writing is trying to capture, um, you know, I, I think it's, I can't remember if it's Emily Towns or Tracy West, these two really great um, womanist ethicists that talk about, you know, truth coming from a multiplicity of voices. So when I think about like diversity, I think about that, about truth coming from a multiplicity of of um, voices from different social positions, from different um, genders, from different, uh, you know, I, I, ethnicities, I don't like saying race or, you know, whatever. Um, I think that's constructed, but yeah, I guess, I guess that's it. I mean, I, I think if we're talking about r- diversity in writing, then I would think about that, about trying to find the truth in a multiplicity of voices. Okay, so for you, it's a matter of having as many voices from as many different backgrounds uh, expressing themselves openly. For sure. And I do think like, I I think like we need to, in this instance, I think in a lot of instances, socially speaking, that we, we can no longer really be talking about equality. We need to talk about equanimity. Um, so, or, or if we want to say it in like layman's terms, rebalancing the fulcrum. So there's just in writing, in music, in entertainment as a whole, in politics, in every facet of life, you know, the, the, um, the voice that has held space for the longest has been a white, straight, cis, hetero, you know, male, um, often in an upper class. So if we're talking about diversity and truly being diverse and truly being equanimous in that, then it's about uplifting voices that are traditionally marginalized. Okay. That, that's not, that makes sense to me. The, the concept of well, you can't just treat people, just treating people equally is is great, but we also need to spend time supporting the voices that haven't gotten support before and supporting the people that haven't gotten support before. For sure. And telling the stories that have historically not been given the space to be told. Um, and I think it's really important. I, I, you know, I've noticed this, what's happening in some of the big five publishing is that uh, they're saying, oh, well, we're talking about we want more diversity in voices, but it's still the same like uh, form story or form letter that we're getting. It just happens to be coming from a black voice or an Asian voice or, you know, um, but, but it's still the same story. Do you know what I mean? I don't know. They, they follow a very certain formula with the writing that ends up being it. It's so templated, I guess would be the way I'd, I would say it is. For sure. And for ends sure. up feeling like it's the same type of thing and doesn't really feel as diverse as it could be because it's still the same general format for the story. Well, yeah, and I think there's a reason for that. I think the reason for that lies behind the fact that the that the target audience is going to be, you know, white middle class women that want to reread the same eat, pray, love story over and over and over again, you know? Mm-hmm. And so I want to I want to scale this back a little bit to talk about use a bit more specifically with writing and diversity. And do you consider yourself 
you talk about hearing voices from multiple different backgrounds. Do you consider yourself to be a part of that diversity in writing and that growth in diversity in writing? Or, and how do you see yourself contributing to diversity in writing? I mean, I, I probably don't see myself as being part of um, that kind of diversity in writing, mainly because I'm not talking about, you know, uh, my own Arab ethnicity. I'm not talking about, well, excuse me, my, a mixed European Arab ethnicity. Um, I'm not talking about stories from that very particular social location. Um, so you're not really getting any diversity in, in that part. I think, I think at least in my genre, which is, you know, dirty realism or transgressive fiction, and I'm really putting fiction in quotations, and we said this last interview, um, <laughs> <laughs> fiction, um, that, that there's just not a lot of women writing in that genre, um, and I don't know if that's maybe because women have, most women have more class and tact than I do, uh, <laughs> or whatever, <laughs> or I, I don't know, or maybe they, they there's more of, um, you know, a, a gripper, the need to feel more feminine, I don't know. Um, I, I think it's, I'm so happy to see more female writers in this genre, but I think the downfall for us is that it's always the same kind of evaluation. And we're trying to be like Ginsburg or, you know, in my case, so you're just trying to be like Bukowski and it's like, this is just how I write. But no, I wouldn't say that I'm, I'm maybe in that sense, you know, as a woman um, coming into dirty realism or, or being a part of that genre, maybe, maybe that's adding to diversity, but I don't, I don't, I don't know if that's supposed to be like a, it could be tokenized, I don't know, but. Mm. Okay, so you, you kind of have mixed feelings about your, whether or not you're part of diversity in writing. For, for sure, like I, I don't think that I came into, into publishing, I really want to be very specific with that, um, you know, because I've always written the way that I write, um, mm. and I have different styles of writing. I have academic writing, I have editorial writing, I have my own poetry, my journaling styles, whatever, but I've always written the way that I write. Um, and like shocker of shockers, I only came across Bukowski about three years ago and I was like, oh cool, somebody else that's a scummy fuck like me. Um, <laughs> but but it's not something that I looked at, you know, I, I guess I had been looking for that type of grit, you know, I was looking for God, what's his name? Jim Carroll from the Basketball Diaries. And I'm like, this is still not enough for me. So when I finally did kind of go down the rabbit hole and find Bukowski, it's like, oh, great. But it's still, you know, like I I grew up with Angelou. So if anybody had been an influence on me, it would have been her. But but I don't know. I, I totally got off track chasing rabbits there. I'm so sorry. <laughs> like, yeah, I, I feel <laughs> really, uh, I don't know, maybe ambivalent. I If... The knee-jerk reaction for me is to say, no, I don't think that I'm contributing any diversity in part, you know, in, in the writing community. Like, if I think about it, then sure, maybe just inherently by being a woman in this genre, it's diverse. I don't know. <laughs> I, think, I think with that, the, you mentioned that it's coming from different backgrounds, right? And so yeah. I just from, from that definition of expanding the the types of voices and the backgrounds of the voices that we're hearing in writing in, in different genres. If you are from a group with a background that's not common in their writing, in, in the genre, then wouldn't that be contribution to diversity by virtue of the fact that you're expanding the types of voices that are being spoken about and that sure. are being read? Yeah, but I mean, it could just be... I mean, I don't think that I, I've entered publishing with the intent to diversify it <clears throat> um, by any means. Um, and also, like, I think this, this word is definitely a buzzword, especially in academia, you know, and we're seeing that more in, like, the cult, uh, corporate environment. Oh, you know, we're, di we're committed to diversity. Okay, well, what do you mean by that? <laughs> you know what I mean? Because you still have a corporate dress code and in um in effect that is very classist and racist you know right. an anti anti woman um and i think that kind of pops off mine because i just had to deal with that myself like mm, mm. um I, I think it's a good aesthetic that a lot of people are trying to employ this idea of diversity but i don't think that i think when pushed to really 
work on diversity, they have no idea what the hell they're talking about. Hmm. And there's a lot of cases of companies or groups of people who will be like, yeah, diversity is great and give the thumbs up in their public face. But then if you were to ask them, OK, what does that actually mean, though, that they wouldn't be able to give a satisfying answer? For sure. I, I, I remember a moment during um, my undergraduate degree. I was at a, a private I was a little white trash person, you know, a uh, little gutter snipe uh, going to this very rich kid private <laughs> undergrad on scholarship. And one of my professors was like, our campus has reached 15% diversity. And before I could stop myself, I was like, oh, that's really interesting. Is that because you're counting all the janitors and cooks and cleaners that are all black? Or are we just talking about the student body? And the whole, the whole room went quiet. I'm like, did I, did I say something wrong? I'm okay, just me. Never mind. You know. Um, yeah. But yeah, I think, I think that's a, a really hot buzzword. I think, like, I think, you know, being woke and being um, into social justice and or peace and justice or whatever you want to call it these days is, is a good aesthetic. But when, when push comes to shove, it's really um, a lot of verbiage containing the same old bullshit. Um, but but trying to look progressive. Mm. And so following up on that with, uh, to, uh, but moving a little bit more towards publishing, uh, what do you think publishers and editors of literary magazines and people in that uh, field in that area uh, can do to increase diversity in publishing? Yeah, I, I think that's a great question. I think that the only, and please, Please forgive me. I'm I'm coming off a, of a, a heavy social ethics womanist <laughs> semester, <laughs> so my brain is right there. I'm like, if you really want to talk about diversity, real diversity in publishing, then I think the priority needs to be given to historically marginalized voices. Um, and and we're not just talking about historically marginalized. Let's talk about the marginalized of the, of the marginalized. Um, I I think that. Black women need to be held up and their voices prioritized far more than most people um, that are getting into publishing right now. If we really want to talk about diversity and we really want to talk about balancing the fulcrum, at least in the United States, that's my um, frame of reference. Uh, my next uh, critique, I guess, would be like, we really need to start prioritizing prioritizing um, um, Palestinian voices, because if you want to talk about the marginalized about, of the marginalized, there we go. Uh, that is one way to drive diversity, especially in a super hyper-Christian, hyper-Zionist American culture. Uh, but I think that will, I mean, if you want to go that far, I, I think that's going to raise some eyebrows for sure. But if you want to stay quote unquote safe, then let's start prioritizing um, the voices of black and brown women and telling their stories, their specific stories from their specific context, not simply trying to put um, blackface on a, a a white woman's story and calling it diverse, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does make sense to me. It's, it's a matter of letting them actually write their stories rather than expecting them to fulfill the like standard format for what a story is quote unquote supposed to be to appeal to their usual audience. It's a matter of being willing to break away from that standard form and accept something that's well written, but different from what they would normally do. Yeah, for sure. And I think that takes a really concerted effort. And I think it takes a lot of um, spine uh, because people are going to get offended, you know? Mm. Um, and and I feel like it's those voices that are like, oh, you know, I don't understand why we need to be diverse. You know, it's the same type of people who are like, oh, affirmative affirmative action is a bad idea. And I'm like, mm, you're kind of racist. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, uh, uh, this might be a low key thing or high key thing for you, but either way, <laughs> yeah, for sure. I'm like, mm, okay. And so touching on that point that you just brought up about uh, people talking about diversity and feeling like it's somehow negative. Uh, at Center Bar Moth, we like to focus on diversity and talk about it and feel that it's about raising, like you mentioned, all voices aside from the mainstream point of view to really have this expansion of experience and uh, being able to enjoy and experience the points of views and the backgrounds of um, 
a bunch of different people, right? Mm -hmm. And so what would you say to those who are arguing against diversity by claiming that somehow focusing on it is silencing the mainstream voices or point of view? I, I, I like, like my knee-jerk reaction is to call them, you know, a piece of shit racist. <laughs> like, <laughs> like that's that's my knee-jerk reaction, and maybe I should filter myself before. But like when you find, it, it's a, look, ninety-nine point nine percent of the time, the people that are arguing against quote-unquote diversity, or at least what they think is diversity, are white people, right? And I think, look, I, I'll try and be empathetic here change is difficult, right? Um, uh, especially if it's happening all at once, but but like white folks need to learn how to let go of of this kind of head, not even kind of, it's the, you know, the hegemonic power of whiteness. Um, like like white needs to maintain the, the majority in everything. And it, it's just like, okay, well, we've heard this story before. So if you're arguing against diversity and allowing space and time and like creativity to hear other other stories besides the same old white thing over and over and over again like you might have a problem with some racism that you need to address and can I recommend a couple books for you <laughs> you know what I mean <laughs> um you know and, and and what does it mean by like silencing mainstream voices like these white you know and I'm, I'm being very specific here white cis hetero male voices are are probably always going to be what is normative and what is um, like held up more, you know, uh, and what is put out there more. Like it's like mainstream media, right? There's a there's a reason why uh, subcultures and and indie presses and non mainstream media exist because a people are tired of hearing only this kind of mainstream narrative and they deem it important that there's something else being said um so yeah yeah i i don't think like main quote I, I don't think that white voices will ever be boy i'm gonna get myself in the shit here i know it but fuck it you know i i don't think white voices will ever be silenced and this idea that it will be is kind of like a little ethno nationalist to me do you know what i mean like next we're going to be talking about how white women need to have more kids oh, wait a minute <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't know if you've been watching the, uh, the the stuff happening in the U.S., but I guess, you know, we're we're heading right down that white ethno-nationalist line, um, which freaks me out. But, right. yeah. So I, I think that it is very important to understand that there's a difference between, well, for one thing, they've already had a lot of publicity. They're part of the mainstream, so the mainstream is always mm -hmm. going to have some force behind it. But also... Just because other people are being lifted up doesn't mean you're being pulled down. Right, exactly. Yeah. Because I, I do think that there is this problem of kind of like crabs in a barrel mentality. Everybody mm -hmm. thinks that everybody else is a crab. So, uh, this is particularly like you, you mentioned with uh, the white cis het male voices in particular. Some of the people I've talked to in the past have been or at least the mainstream have been like but what about what does that do against me how does that will pull my yeah. options down it's like you have oh, so many right. options already it's really not right. this is giving you know, other people a way in to what you already have <laughs> right and you know what's particularly interesting like that idea of of like allowing other the the response to allowing other people the same amount of time and space to do to, to do and have what white people have already and and white people's reaction to that is well what about me is so intensely narcissistic like i can't handle it um it, it's crazy it's crazy and so i want to change topics a little bit here away from that because I, yeah. I think we've gotten some good talks but if we continue this we're going to be agreeing with each other and be like you're so right you're amazing <laughs> and then it's going to turn into a downward spiral of like those fucking white people man you know like it always does and so i want i want to pull it back a little bit and talk about your writing in in particular with uh with your writing you touch on pain and loss quite a bit and what drives that focus for you um well i mean i it's I feel like, you know, whatever is coming out of my brain, it comes out on the paper. There, I don't um, intentionally write very often. I think like my upcoming book is 
the one piece of like intentional writing that I did. And maybe that's why I think it's actually good because <laughs> like, I didn't just let <laughs> chaos come out of my brain. Um, but I, but if I had to think about it, like what is compelling about the human condition are those moments of pain and loss and, um, and love and empathy and like these, these very vulnerable bits of ourselves that we try and hide from one another. Um, yeah, I think maybe that, that drives that focus or, or at least unintentionally does or unconsciously does so like I, I feel closer to people and maybe this is coming from my own damaged space, but like, I feel so much more, um, part of like the human species when I find somebody or some piece of writing or music or whatever that is able to speak to whatever the, the kind of negative shit that I've felt because so, so much of like American culture right now, excuse me, like U S American culture, we were a huge continent. Um, so much of like U S American culture is, predicated upon this kind of toxic positivity and every look how great everything is in my life and I think that makes a, a lot of us feel super alienated and then when we come across some something or somebody that's like yeah things are kind of shitty and this is why and they're being honest about it I think that's compelling and I think that that we connect with that on some level and I think it reminds us like hey I'm human and other people are human too and maybe we can be human together <laughs> you know mm. And so it's not an, an active thing for you, but it's sort of just, it's what you respond to well. And so that ends up being how you also express yourself. For sure. And I, I definitely wonder at times if like what comes out on a piece of paper for me, because I'm a savage and I'm still writing with paper and pen. Um, uh, I, I wonder if that really, I mean, it probably is a product of the way that my brain has been wired over the years due to like trauma or whatever, you know, that tends to be the focus. Maybe, I, I don't know. Um, but I do write a lot about love too. Like I, I have been on like a rash of love poems lately, which is really disgusting. I need to get back to my, uh, <laughs> harder hitting pieces people are going to start thinking I'm a one trick pony uh, and I don't like that but yeah okay so you're, you're writing well it's not always on this you 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 kind of just fall you I think we've talked about this before where you, you sort of just kind of go with the flow of your, how you're feeling and put that out there and for sure and with yeah. that with uh your journey and your process with going into uh, poetry and fiction writing and such, what would be something that you think would surprise people if you were to tell them about your journey? Um, hmm. Let's see. Uh, my fiction is not fiction. Um, I think everybody knows that by now, though. Like, my fiction, <laughs> my, my, my pieces of flash fiction are things that actually happen to me. Uh, so like if you've read Newports or, um, like child locks or whatever, those are things that actually happen. I am not, uh, uh, well, I mean, I think that I have a propensity to fantasize about things that happen in my life. Like I'm going to get this job. And then when I have that money, I'm going to go buy some cute leather chaps or something. You know what I mean? Like I definitely <laughs> have that kind, that kind of wishful thinking of, of like pl future planning or whatever, but I don't have the type of, um, of imaginative mind to be able to create worlds and people in dialogue out of thin air. It's just not, I, and I think that's maybe why I'm a really shitty liar. Uh, I just don't have that kind of creative spark. So all of my quote fiction is just not, it's not fiction. It's things that happen. And, and um, yeah, that's uh, maybe, maybe that would be surprising. I think, the other thing is that like, I don't sit down and intentional. I'm like writing is a compulsion. I'm always writing something. Um, but like, I don't sit down at 5 PM and crack a beer or some coffee or get my desk set up and go on. Okay. I'm going to intentionally write this poetry now. Um, it comes when it comes and like when blocks happen, they happen. And I, it's either because I'm trying to write something and can't get it out. I've had that happen before where like, I need to tell this one story 
and like I can't bear to write it just yet. But I just it's kind of like a depressive episode, right? You just kind of have to wait it out. Um, but I don't force myself to write. Um, I think when you do that, like bad things come out like crappy quality and it doesn't come off as authentic anymore. So like, I'm not going to like, if I'm feeling a love poem, for example, like I'm going to write the love poem. If I'm feeling like, Hey, I need to write something about hot dogs today. That's where it's going. <laughs> you know, unfortunately <laughs> that's getting posted to the blog, but you know, whatever. And so for you with your writing, there's kind of always that in parentheses based on real events tag. <laughs> For sure, like the uh, it is uh it is a veneer of fiction if we can call it that the thinnest of it's like a top coat you know for your nail polish just like <laughs> clear top coat and like I, I very intentionally don't use people's names or like identifying things it's it's you know so it like there's what do they call that um deniable plausible deniability whatever. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, no, it never happened, but it it, it did. Like, I, I wrote a story about uh, a woman um, peeing on the subway when I was in New York City last semester, and that is absolutely true. It absolutely happened. You know, <laughs> I, I just don't know how to world build, you know. And what's the old saying? You know, you write what you know. Right. Yeah. I definitely understand that because I've, when, when I wrote my book I was there obviously it it it's a fantasy world with like pixies and such so mm -hmm. I, it delves into things that are outside reality but a lot of the references that I make are or at least like the personalities of people and such or even the characters I do take bits and pieces from people that I've met over the years mm -hmm. it's not just I'm making this entity just cut from the whole cloth of my imagination and there's no basis for it it's very much well i've met people who express themselves in this way i've met people who are this kind of bubbliness even though yeah. that's not something that i would normally be myself it's something that i can be like i've met this type of person i know how they act or yeah. i've seen like these types of people and here's how i'd imagine if you combined these pieces together Oof. Yeah, uh, you know, it, it, thinking about stuff like that or trying to imagine myself doing it, I'm like, I, you know, what blows my mind is like the crime and mystery writers. I'm like, how do you keep from the reader <laughs> who did the thing? Like, you almost have to work backwards. And like, I don't that like I have such respect for fiction writers, especially like mystery and crime writers, because that is a talent I do not have. And it sounds super complicated. Um, you know, I, I think about somebody like like I love urban fantasy stuff um like Cassandra Clare's Mortal Instruments is a big one it's young adult whatever I love it um but like the amount of imagination that it takes to think of this whole world um within within the shell of a, a an actual city and an actual world is just like mind-blowing to me I'm like well can't do that so I'm like well, I'm gonna stick to what I'm good at you know but I admire the shit out of it and respect these people like wow that's superhuman yeah I've read some stories in some books and I'm just like I could never do this I I've read it I see what they did and if you asked me to make something similar I would fail miserably oh and it's my God, okay being yeah, and it, it is. I mean, like, think about the granddaddy of fantasy, Tolkien, right? Like, this dude is brilliant. I forget just making up a whole world of just, like, Lord of the Rings. Then he went back and did, like, a history, you know, <laughs> a, right. a long history of Middle Earth and, and, like, made up languages. Or, like, what kind of absolute god sent to, to Earth, like, your blessed brain, your blessed brain. <laughs> I, don't, I don't even understand. It's just incredible. And I think even with, with Tolkien, though, Tolkien had a, a history in language. Like, he had studied mm -hmm. languages. And so uh, with that, uh, to with Tolkien studying languages, there that becomes a matter of, okay, that's still taking a reference from what he knows, right? Yeah. So I wouldn't be able to do that. I don't, I've never studied languages. I don't have any of that, but that's something that he specialized in. 
So yeah. being able to expand from his working knowledge of languages and such is still taking reference from real things that he's experienced to then create the the languages of Middle Earth, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, you see kind of Orwell doing that in his in his stuff too of uh, 1984. I think it's Orwell Animal Farm too, like that. Mm. I don't know that type of um you know creativity I don't know like I, I just think that 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 is just not something that I'm capable of and I admire it and respect it and um bless god you know <laughs> well while that's a different form of uh writing and a different form of uh, a different style from what you do your style is still very appealing and has a following of it though and I wanted to ask you if you found the world of publishing to be welcoming to your point of view and your voice and your style so far. I think, um, <laughs> you know, I, I think that it's a acquired taste for sure. You know, um, I think it's been welcome among the publishers that publish it for sure, you know. Um, and I think it's definitely been well received um, amongst uh, a, a certain kind of twisted humor sense of people, like twisted sense of humor that people have. Uh, I, I think people like me who are, um, you know, a little like like degenerates, you know what I mean? Like, I, I think like that has been super well received. Um, and um, yeah, it's it's been welcoming. I, I've seen a couple like... Uh, one-off reviews that have been like, oh, this is, this is terrible. You know, that, you know, you go and look at the kind of books they like and they're reading Hemingway and you're like, well, what the, what did you expect from a book called Fuck It? You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> did you expect Leaves of Grass? You know what I mean? I'm like, um, somebody, this one of my favorite reviews, it's the only negative review I got and I was in love with it and whoever wrote it, um, deleted it, but he called Fuck It uh, quote, the literary equivalent to a dick drawn on a bathroom wall. And I, <laughs> I loved that so much. I ended up stealing it and putting it on my, like my Twitter bio. And I'm like, that is perfect. That's the perfect example of like description of me as a human being, right? Like, like I'm just one big shit post. And like, that is something I would do, draw a dick on a bathroom wall. It's, it's immature and kind of like dumbly funny and, and um and just like a real thing somebody would do and i really wish they would have kept that negative review up because i i was in love with it 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 made me so happy <laughs> <laughs> that is a fun review i i think that some of the negative reviews end up being funnier and more memorable yeah. like in a sense than the the positive ones like the positive ones are like i feel great i appreciate you thank you for enjoying my work right and thank you I'm for expressing confused. that yeah, but I'm then, confused by the good reviews for sure. <laughs> but then some of the negative reviews, I remember one I got was that my book was aggressively straight was the phrase that they what? used. Like they, it was almost too straight, they said. And it was just hilarious to me because there's there's two male main like uh, characters uh -huh. throughout the story that we follow, but they're they're not in a romantic relationship at all, right? Uh -huh. And so I didn't try to make any chemistry for that. I didn't try to make any signals for it, but somehow this person ended up thinking that they would end up doing something, like they would end up in a, oh. a homosexual relationship. So they came in with some expectations, I assume. And then they weren't met, and they wrote this like long review about how it wasn't what they expected, and then the story just... It felt like it dragged on from a technical perspective. It felt very much like their feelings were hurt that they weren't the two main characters weren't gay. And then everything yeah. else after that was just them being upset about that and throwing a temper tantrum. But it was so yeah. long and it was the the phrasing of it aggressively straight just <laughs> has stuck with me. And my book has been out for a long time. This was a review from the uh the pre-reading, like the the advanced reader copy. So this wasn't even mm -hmm. after it was published. It was before it was published. And I still remember it as this just great review. <laughs> oh, it was a no. negative review, but it was really great because it was memorable. And I think that your dick 
drawing on a writing on a bathroom wall is kind of similar to that where it's like that's just really sticks with me <laughs> yeah I, you know I think also like I think that's hard too <laughs> um you know and I don't know how it is from like a a, a, a gay male perspective I could talk it's a queer female that like I hesitate if if I was doing fiction, I would, even if I was recounting some of my own stories, I guess, <clears throat> and doing my, my quote fiction, um, I would be super hesitant to talk about, um, uh, about like lesbian sex and love because, you know, when does it, when does my intent of representation cross the line into well I guess it it really is based upon subjectivity and and observation but like it's I don't want I don't know maybe I should just say what I'm going to say is uh I don't want to create lesbian relationships or even talk about my own lesbian relationships for it to be a three-ring circus or for it to be fetishized or like it turns into some type of weird pornography you know like I I think there's one I think it's difficult given you don't know. It it doesn't happen when you're writing for a queer audience. It always happens when you're writing for a straight audience. I don't know. Um, Like, especially being women, you know, this idea of like, ooh, two women. Very strange. I don't know. I I, I don't know if if other writers feel that same type of um, tension. I definitely know Ginsburg didn't. I mean, my God, some of the stuff he was putting out. Whew, he wanted an audience for sure. Um, but like, I think I think it needs to be talked about just because we need to get we need to get rid of and eliminate heteronormativity, you know. But I I don't want you know a portion of my own sex life being treated like you know fetishizing it and and. Ooh, you, you know, I don't know. Yeah, I think that this is definitely <laughs> something that's important to talk about when it comes to talking about uh, marginalized groups or diversity, both for mm-hmm. sexuality as well as for ethnicity and, and everything, is just because you're part of that group doesn't obligate you to talk about your experiences yeah. as a member of that group, right? If yeah. it's it's a matter of the people who are comfortable and willing to do so, should have the opportunity to express themselves but we shouldn't be trying to force it onto people which i think is something that also is a, a problem sometimes that happens is mm-hmm. you'll you'll get the people who are taking it the wrong way when they talk about accepting diversity instead they're yeah. trying to push people to talk about their experiences even if they're not comfortable with it which then isn't helping <laughs> for sure for sure. And, and in yeah. a way, I'd say that I'd say it's even more, uh, it can be even more damaging than the people who are just saying, well, I don't want diversity at all because it, it can make people feel less willing and less welcome into the space. For sure. And I think it runs the risk of, of traumatizing them in a really real, um, profound way. You know, if you're you're getting people or forcing people to talk about something that they're just they're they don't want to or they're they're unwilling, you know, <clears throat> and I think about, <clears throat> uh, you know, my, the first example that comes to my head is, um, you know, trans representation and the mm-hmm. question everybody wants to ask of, for, uh, you know, trans person. God knows, like I was married to a trans woman many years ago, um, you know, the first question anytime anybody found that off was, you know, questions about your genitals. And it's like, my God, do you have any sense of like, what is appropriate? What is, what is not like, and that is me saying that, you know, and I don't have a right. scrap of appropriateness in my body, but you know, like, I, I, I think that, um, forcing people, um, into spaces where they're, they are compelled, they are forced to talk about something that they are not comfortable with, it's inappropriate, um, or or they just don't want to, for reasons of their own privacy, can be extremely damaging, extremely traumatic for them. And, and I think that that's not actually diversity at that point, because diversity is a matter of being open to people who are willing, mm-hmm. who are going to talk about their experiences. It's not a matter of forcing people to talk about their experiences. For sure. Yeah, absolutely. 
And so I wanted to ask you with uh, being outside the mainstream and talking about things that aren't the mainstream, uh, what would be one piece of advice that you would give to fellow writers, fellow authors who are not in the mainstream and want to talk about topics or points of view that aren't part of that mainstream format or mainstream uh, perspective? Um, ignore, ignore the big five would be my biggest you know stop stop trying to write for them um you know uh they're just not gonna take it they're not they're not like those big publishing houses are not willing to take the risk that small pubs and indie pubs do and thank god you know like thank god for independent publishers and small publishing houses that can and do and are happy to take the risk and are really adamant about opening the space for different voices. Um, God bless every single one of you, really, geez. Um, so yeah, ignore the big five and just be authentic about what you're writing. Like, don't, like, fuck the audience. Don't worry about it. Write what you need to write and how you need to write it and keep subbing um, to pubs just because you got 10 no's doesn't mean that like there are literally millions and millions and mil like, just look at Twitter, man. Like there are millions <laughs> of, of pub of independent publishers out there all over the world that are covering every topic you could possibly imagine. I I'm positive. There is some type of like Sasquatch loving pub out there. You know what I mean? <laughs> like there's something right. for everybody. Um, so just, it's a numbers game. Keep going, keep going, keep public, you know, keep, trying to submit and you will eventually get a pub and your voice will be out there and i would say the next thing which is really the reality of this situation is lower your expectations uh you know we i think anybody that wants to be a writer has these wild fantasies of you know being uh you know new york times bestseller and all this money and ooh, we're going to be the next jk rowling without being a you know turf piece of shit um and we're going to make this money and we're going to make a living or we're going to be the next george R. R. martin or the next Charlene harris or you know some some big writer that can danielle Steele, whatever um that can make a living on writing that is just not the case it is it is the minority that that is the exception to the rule um so get ready to work a shitty job and you know and publish your books and be happy that they're out there um, and get paid a little bit. And, you know, that, that, you know, lower your expectations. You want to, you want to, um, <laughs> you want to promote it better start, better go take a course on Skillshare, you know, <laughs> or, or get ready to pony up some money on Fiverr or something, you know, <laughs> that you can have a professional do a book release. I mean, if you're that adamant about getting your stuff into the mainstream from the underbelly of the writing community, you're going to have to spend some, some ducats on, on getting a, um, a promoter if that's what your goal is. I don't know. And so your your advice would be one, just be willing to put it out there. Don't give up because you've gotten a few no's. Yeah. And then the second would be understand what you're getting into. That writing is not generally going to be a career, especially starting off in writing. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. That even even if you want it to be a career, you're going to need uh probably several books out first before it starts really building any momentum. And even sure. then, a living is very different from huge fame and success. <laughs> For sure. And I think I think it's even more difficult if you are writing from the underbelly, from, from outside of the big five. You know, obviously you're not writing part of their formula. Uh, right. You're not writing the kind of stuff that middle-class liberal white women want to read that makes them feel you know, nice and good and warm at the end of the day and that they're the white knights of the universe or, you know, whatever. Um, if you are writing something very different or, or you know, you could even go the, the way of Stephen King or what's that guy's name that does all the Tom Clancy, you know what I mean? Um, if you're not writing like these people, if you are not writing within the mainstream with the idea of catering to the mainstream, like getting to that level of success is, I mean, it's almost impossible to begin with while you're in the mainstream 
forget it if you're coming from our area you know let's let's be real and that's okay you know who the hell wants that kind of i mean i'll take a billion (laughs) you know (laughs) but but like i don't know like that that's not something that i ever consider like i'm gonna make a whole bunch of money on this book great just think about this as your art right and 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 you're finding a gallery that will hang your art and a pub that loves your stuff and cool great it's out there i don't know like (laughs) I hate to be that kind of like asshole that's like just be happy with what you get. You know what I mean? That's not what I mean. I mean like like stay stay authentic, um, keep subbing, and and like you ain't gonna be a millionaire, baby. Like just let's be realistic about what what is to be expected of this. I think that that's an important message. Is the I think the one that you said about authenticity is really, and the ones that you said about like not giving up and continuing to sub are really important messages for people to hear because I've, I've talked to some people and they've been like well maybe nobody wants to hear what i have to say and to anyone listening if you're if you're thinking that there is an audience for everything for sure and i'd like to add a follow-up to that but like it, <clears throat> uh well i'm gonna sound like an asshole what is it that you're trying to say do you know what i mean like if there might be a reason why nobody wants to read what you're writing, you know what I mean? As in you suck or you, you know, or you're Donald Trump writing some stupid shit. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, absolutely. There's an audience for everything often to some people's detriment. You know, <laughs> like, <Yeah. laughs> um, like I think there are some books that maybe just shouldn't have been, shouldn't have been published. Um, Anything coming out of the Trump camp, sure, that's one. Um, but like, hone your craft. I, I mean, I get like the point of that of me saying all this is like maybe the reason it's not resonating is because you need to like hone your craft and and maybe you're not saying anything, you know. Mm. Um, because I've seen some manuscripts of friends of mine where I'm like, what are you like, what are you doing here? And like, I'm just dicking around. Like I can tell, <laughs> like, you don't have to have a meaningful moral at the end of the story, but you know, you say something. something right. Like, you know, Twitter can be a pain in the ass because well, now it's more than 140 characters, but back in my day, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's a hundred, it's 140 characters or 250 characters to say nothing at all. So how much more so are you writing a 10,000 word manuscript and you are saying nothing at all? Uh, that might be a very real possibility, but if you're not doing that and you are saying something, uh, yes, please continue to, to push. Um, I think we know when we have something in our hands that are that is important to say. Um, so if you're not getting if you feel that way about your work, um, then keep submitting. There is an audience for everything. I think something I would I'd like to add to that is that even if we're not adding to the like conversation for diversity or we're not specifically like you mentioned yourself that you wouldn't feel comfortable talking about your your experiences as a, a queer individual. And even if we're not talking about these types of things, it that's okay. And when you're when you're writing writing to have some if you have something that you want to express and you're expressing your art, your expression yeah. is the important thing, right? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And and that if if you're being true to yourself and true to what you want to write that's a lot more important than trying to fit any particular mold because i think that mm-hmm. it's it's not any different to try and write for the big uh the big four now actually uh big, the, they're no the big five the big four i have to remind myself of that sometimes but it's 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 not that much different to try and write for the big four and the mainstream as it is to try and make yourself write a story about queer experience or about black experience or about uh, Palestinian experience. If that's not something that's authentic to you, they don't feel comfortable doing, don't force yourself into it. Right. Yeah, because it's not going to come off as authentic anymore. <clears throat> you know, it's going to come off very forced, for sure. 
Um, yeah, I, I think, and I think it's difficult too. When you're a writer, your medium is your, I'm going to get, you know, old school here, but it, it is your pen and your paper and your words. And that's hard. Uh, oh, uh, you know, another piece of advice for <clears throat> writers that are submitting, you know, into publishing, <clears throat> please, please do yourself the favor, emotionally disconnect from your work, write that little shit and be done with it. It is not your baby. You are not, <clears throat> excuse me, you're not feeding it. You are not putting away a college fund. You are not empty nesting when it's gone. <laughs> like you have got for your own mental health, please emotionally disconnect from your writing when you begin to submit, because if you do not every single rejection, and there will be a lot of them, you know what I mean? Every single rejection is going to be a mental health hit to you. Like <clears throat> just write it and let it go out in the world. If it, it's rejected, it's rejected. Who cares? You know? I think that's uh, some good advice for people is to, keep themselves emotionally and mentally well throughout the process is very important. You know, take care of your mental health and do what you need to do to do that and understand what you're doing. And, and so I want to bring yeah. this back around to talk about you a bit more. And uh, with your writing, you have mentioned before that you've been writing basically your entire life. And it just is something that happens for you. <clears throat> What would you say is your goal as a writer? Do you have a specific goal or is it just something that you're writing and you're like, I'm writing, so I might as well put it out there? Um, you know, writing for me is a couple, I, I think I said this earlier, you know, writing for me is <clears throat> compulsion. I'm always doing it, whether it be journaling or an academic paper or, you know, poetry or, you know, a, a fiction, you know, fiction, whatever you're going to call it that or, um, <laughs> I mean, lately it's been academic stuff, but like, it's just something that I've done since I was a kid. It's, it's the way that I process like what happens in my life. It's the way that I process the world around me. It's the way that I process my own thoughts and emotions. <clears throat> so it's always happening. Uh, I, I think that would be my only goal. You know, it's, it's, it's very much a self centered ooh, it's a very much a self-centered process because i'm not writing for an audience i'm writing for me so like if i write a poem about you know shitting my pants it's because i'm trying to <laughs> process why that <laughs> happened to me and why my life is god's shit post you know <laughs> um so like uh, you know or or it's just it's a memory that came out of my head at one point in this adhd riddled brain uh, what if I'm, I'm writing a love poem or, or something that, you know, lately I've been kind of touching on or trying to get comfortable writing about some of the more difficult aspects of my life where I'm kind of sticking my toe in the water. It's always about processing. It's always about getting rid of something. I'm not getting rid of it, I guess, but like dealing with it or putting into words some type of feeling that I'm feeling at that moment. So yeah like the goal of my writing is really to just go through this journey of of processing and like maybe mental health uh, and healing or just catharsis or you know it's like therapy right um yeah so i don't know that that there's any external goal of like yeah i want to be the next you know i don't know Stephen King or or I want to make a career out of this or you know yeah it'd be great it'd be great to make a million bucks off this stuff but that's not my intention it's not even on my horizon uh I'm just writing to get the shit out uh like it's like lancing a boil you're getting rid of the toxins <clears throat> so like if I, another piece of mine never gets published again I'm still good it doesn't you know like, it's no big deal. It's always a surprise. Like, man, you want to publish this shit? Okay, cool. All right. You know, you're sick. I like you. You know? <laughs> uh, but, like, I'm I'm so happy. Like, that, and that's why I think, like, these good reviews on these books is, like, man, okay. Like, I don't get it. I'm just kind of processing my own bullshit here. But I'm glad people found some meaning in it and, like, and they like it or it speaks to them on some level. Um, right. uh, but... Yeah, like if I if it if not another piece of mine is published again, I'm totally fine 
with that. So for you, writing is it's a personal it's part of your personal journey and it's part of how you process your personal journey and work through everything that's going on in your life and anything outside of that is a bonus. Yeah, yeah, it's a surprise. It surprises the hell out of me. I'm like, okay, cool, all right. This is, this is cool. <laughs> This is weird and wild and, you know, uh, I like, you know, I am deeply, it is very surreal. You know, like I remember being in kindergarten, I think maybe I told us on the last podcast, but like drawing these little, like right, they were stapled pieces of paper. I really remember this in kindergarten, very much so little stapled pieces of paper where I write like fairy tales, you know, and I, I specifically re- remember like rewriting the princess and the pea and doing like little kid scribble drawings of it in like this picture book you know and um and like being a writer has been my you know whatever the hell that means uh has been my dream I, I know I've always wanted to be a published writer if I was being specific so having now coming up in July my third book coming out like that is a very weird very surreal moment um for me it, it doesn't feel real uh because it's a dream actualized, you know, and it's, it's weird and exciting and cool and almost, uh, it's almost like it, it didn't happen, you know, cause it's just so weird. Like I just like three, like three, let alone one, I mean, one was a big deal. Now we're on three. That's creepy. And cool. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's <laughs> like, exciting, wow. but strange. Yes. It's very strange. And then to get reviews on it, like, what parallel universe am I living in that people give a shit enough about this weird thing thing that I put out that they're reviewing it? Like that is, I don't, you know, I don't even review shit on Amazon. So like the amount of effort to go through and write a review about something like that is beautiful. And like the reason I do reviews, you know, on my site of indie writers is because like, I think that is the best way to support other writers in indie pubs. Like let's get money in these people's hands and like, let's spread these incredible um, stories that people are telling that we would have never known about had it not been for indie presses. Um, Yeah. Yeah, I, I do think signal boosting is very important and very helpful to be able to support each other. And that's something that we can do without, uh, investing any money because let's be real we're not the big four so we don't have tons of money to throw at people but we can still provide support to our fellow authors and fellow writers by interacting with what they have and sharing it with the people that we know and sharing it through to the audiences that we have and letting it get out there and i want to bring this all kind of to back to the uh publishing as a whole and ask you if there was one message you could get the publishing community, large and small, to hear and kind of understand. Do you have one message that you would say and what would it be? Uh, the publishing community. Shit, I don't know. Uh, you know, that's a stumper. I got a head scratch there for a minute. A message to the publishing community, not writers I'm taking. Um, Okay, I got one for publishers. Please update your um, submission (laughs) guidelines and use real, real words about what you are looking for. Please don't talk about how you want people to submit the rattling empty wine bottles under their bed. What the fuck does that mean? I don't, you know what I mean? Like if you are publishing and interested in publishing a specific genre, say that. Do you know what I mean? Like, I don't know. Look, we want the skeletons in your closet and the spider webs in your butt crack. Like what the fuck does that, please stop. <laughs> stop with this bullshit language. Cause all of us I know are confused. You know what I mean? Like that's the only thing that I can come up with at this point in time as like, please, please, I'm begging you. <laughs> Please, please don't do this anymore. Yeah, please be clear with what you want. I think that's a good message to have because I, I do agree that it can be a bit confusing when you look at a, a publisher's website and they don't say what they want exactly and you're forced to guess. I think yeah. if you're having to guess if if you're going to appeal to them, 
it it makes it difficult to feel comfortable trying to submit to them to begin with because like maybe this isn't is this really the the spider web from my butt crack i don't know have i yeah. put that on the page i don't that that may not be what i've done and it can make yeah. it harder for writers to feel okay with submitting and i've talked with some writers before and they've been like yeah i mean i'd like to submit but i don't know if these publishers would actually like my work and that yeah. would be a lot more like try there should be a, a level of transparency and we want to try to demystify the process as much as possible so that yeah. pe writers can be like, oh, this publisher wants this type of writing. This publisher is interested in dirty realism. This publisher is interested in high fantasy or maybe yeah. both, you know, whatever they're into, like whatever you're planning on publishing is fine, but let the writers yeah. know. And, and I think like... I think this is a mark of, oh, I'm going to get myself into deep shit here. Oh, boy. Do I say it? Do I not say it? I think this, I'm going to, fuck it, let's just do it. I think that, you know, these types of descriptions are people who have very little experience in this industry, um, you know, and, and want to be different and interesting and eccentric and, you know, whatever. Like, we want moonbeams and you know, fairy wings. Well, what the fuck genre is that? Do you know what I mean? Like, what what is that? Is that high fantasy? Is that like, po look, what do you want? What do you want? Do you want poetry? Do you want prose? Like, I think that some of, I think that the best pubs out there know that simplicity is key in, in this very specific instance of like submission guidelines, right? Right. Um, <clears throat> simplicity is key. Hey, we are looking for prose poetry that falls into grit, grit, lit, noir, meat poetry, blah, 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 blah. Cool. That's where we like, okay, I don't fall into that. I don't submit. When you say that you want moonbeams and fairy wings and I don't know, snakes and snails and puppy dogs tails, you're not, you're not setting a realistic expectation. You're confusing writers because those are subjective terms, right? So, right. like, do you want Halloween poems? What, what do you want? Like, j be clear. Um, and then and then those pubs will go on and say, oh, well, nobody's submitting. Well, no shit, you're not clear. Um, right. You know, oh, I got another one, please. Whatever it is, like, I personally do not think that it is acceptable. I don't think it's, let's even just remove the word professional because that's loaded. I don't think it embraces the humanity of the person that is sending you writing to never respond with a rejection letter. It could be a form letter. Dear whatever, whatever your name is. We read your stuff. We don't think it's a good fit. Thank you so much for submitting. We look forward to you trying again. Whatever press name, you know what I mean? Can right. be as simple as that, cut and paste. Please stop not responding to people that are submitting to your your magazine, your book, your anthology, whatever. It's not cool. It is not human focused. It is not empathetic. It's not it's not fucking cool. Like, you know, and then have these crazy submission rules like, oh, no simultaneous sub, you know, submissions. Like, that's bullshit. Come on. Like. And it shouldn't take three months to get back. Like, I'm not saying you need a couple days, but like a month is a good time frame and just pop out a form letter. Hey, this didn't work for us. You know, right. we're so sorry. Thank you, whatever. But like, please respond to the people that are are submitting to your pub. Um, like, it's a human on the other end of the interbutt. Uh, and like, let's affirm that humanity. I think that's a good message to end on, is, uh, yeah. in a sense, is saying, let's affirm each other's humanity. Let's understand that we're all humans and let's respect that with how we function and how we operate around each other. Yeah. And, and yeah. so I wanted to thank you, Leah, for talking with me today and being on the Writer's Triangle. And thank you for all of our beautiful moss for listening. Thank you. Uh, so uh, can you tell us and everybody listening where to find you on social media? 
Oh, I, you can find me at www.homesthatsuck.com. <laughs> um, and Twitter, I never remember my own Twitter handle. Isn't that terrible? I think it's something like at suck ass poetry or something like that. You know? Sounds I think right in, to me. I think it is. And uh, this is terrible. I should have it written on my hand all the time. And I'm on Instagram, which is a, a joke. Um, but I, I post like really cute outfits there or something. I don't know what I'm doing. Uh, at the T H E E uh, Leia John. So it's there. I'm there. Whatever that means. Confused and scared <laughs> <laughs> all the time. So there you go. And just for your confirmation, at suck ass poetry is correct. I just checked. Did you? <laughs> Good job. You remembered it. All right. And so all of our listeners, uh, thank you for listening. Thank and be sure to visit cinnabarmoth.com or cinnabarmothliteraryCollections.com and check out the transcripts and we'll also have the social media links. And thank you for coming on today. Yeah. And thank you for I'll having talk me. To you, I'll talk to all of you beautiful moths another time. And goodbye. Bye.